everyone! Welcome to episode number 620 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. We are talking about test and measurement today, y'all. My guest is Ritu Favre, president of Emerson Test and Measurement. Ritu and I explore the biggest trends in test and measurement today, the challenges of creating tests for systems newly incorporating AI into their designs, and what advice she would give to engineers just starting off their careers. So without further ado, please welcome Ritu to Fish Fry. Hi, Ritu. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. Okay, so first off, what do you think are the biggest trends in test and measurement these days? Yeah, so what we're seeing here, and I, and and we're now part of Emerson, what we've been seeing in the market is there's an increasing amount of complexity in test. There's a lot of new technologies that are coming out. We're starting to see a lot of new standards that are driving technical innovation and a lot of demand on kind of product requirements. We're seeing that the needs for tests are becoming more stringent. We also see our customers asking for increased quality, reliability. They need more tests because test is becoming more complicated. And we're also seeing the need for a new TNM, meaning test and measurement tools and approach. So what we're finding is that our products not only have a higher level of integration that must be tested, but a lot of the products are embedding artificial intelligence and other kind of product level decision making capabilities. What we also see in the market is that the current test and measurement tools are not advancing at the same rate as the complexity in the technology. And so we're, again, starting to see a lot of demand for quality and reliability, particularly in aerospace and automotive. As you know, quality has always been an important part of getting a product to market, but for automotive and aerospace, it's mission critical. So what we've seen from an inflection point is that these critically complex systems have reached a level where the standards for quality, reliability and testing are significantly increased inside the validation space to help our customers avoid substantial risks. The challenge that we're seeing in test and measurement is how to adapt to the requirements, what technologies can be leveraged so that we can drive business value, and then efficiency and outcomes for our customers. Ritu, how is NI dealing with these issues? Yeah, let me talk a little bit about how we're thinking about transforming test as we're in this place where there's just so much complexity. We really want to help our customers transition test into a strategic business advantage, which means taking advantage of intelligence across an open, scalable test system and really gaining powerful insights from test data and then optimizing test workflows so that we can enhance integration of engineering expertise and deliver real-time visibility, really empowering our customers, engineers, and their organizations to respond dynamically to these ever-evolving test needs. Our approach at NI is to allow customers to connect their data across the teams and the workflows and to adapt very quickly to increasingly complex systems and emerging technologies. For us, intelligent test goes beyond just leveraging AI in test. It ensures that our entire software and hardware ecosystem is adaptable and ready for any kind of changes that come tomorrow. We do see a lot of opportunity for AI to make an impact across the hardware and software stack. So kind of to recap, our intelligent test approach translates into measurable business value for our customers by helping them reduce time to market through optimized test strategies improving their product quality through predictive insights, helps them to lower their operational costs through intelligent resource utilization, and enhancing decision-making through data-driven recommendations. All right. Let's also discuss the growing role of AI in test hardware and software design as well. What are you seeing here? So we're already starting to see in AI, we're seeing benefits in the semiconductor space. I'll talk a little bit about that. 
We are finding ways to extend across more industries beyond just semiconductor. We're seeing a lot of really good results with test time reduction uh, using machine learning models. We can find that our customers can run fewer tests with the same coverage. And we also see a lot of good results in root cause analysis, which we find can uh, reduce time by as much as 80%. So as you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning have been part of tests for a long time. What we're finding now is that AI is evolving and it's become a way to reduce mundane tasks so that test engineers can focus more on business outcomes like quality, timing, and delivery, and cost. What we're finding also is that AI becomes a companion that's built into hardware and software, which enables engineers to automate routine tasks so they can focus more on their subject matter expertise and on more complicated challenges. What we're also finding is that generative AI is sort of this new space that's coming, and it's really transforming test and measurement. We continue to see a lot of potential of leveraging generative AI. What we've seen within NI is that we can see cases where in test development workflows, we can find Gen AI helps us write test code. It helps us sequence tests and it interacts with the hardware. So there's a real opportunity in test and measurement to use Gen AI by understanding existing code, generating new code, and then navigating complex data sheets and manuals. What we see in the end is that AI will enable more access to test and measurement expertise, which is going to make it easier and more efficient for engineers to get their jobs done by helping them get a lot more insights from the data and really be able to let them leverage a much wider user base. Regardless of how intelligent and intuitive AI becomes, test engineers remain essential to ensuring quality and performance. One thing that we've been talking a lot about here at NI is how do you keep humans in the loop? It's very critical to have a human in the loop to capture nuance and really prevent issues such as overfitting, hallucinations, and bias. Absolutely. Now, are there also challenges in creating tests for systems that are starting to incorporate AI into their own products? Absolutely, yes. And one of the things that we're finding is we get further into the space. I mean, if you think about test and measurement, you're putting a stimulation on a product or a a device under test and you get a response. What we're finding is that the way that the data is collected in these responses, there's a pretty big gap, both in the quality of the way that the data is collected as well as the quantity. As we look at our next generation technologies, it re- demands a robust influx of high quality data. And what we, I mean by kind of high quality data is that it's collected in a consistent format with strong governance and with the context that's needed to effectively apply AI. We have a product here at NI called System Link, which enables ingestion, processing, and analysis of lab scale test and system data. We're prioritizing investments here at NI in data acquisition processing and analytics so that we can be ready for the new advances in AI. One of the pieces that we had a critical realization about as we've moved forward is, again, this gap in just the way the data is collected and stored and then formatted. One of the assumptions was that the existing data suffices for AI-driven insights, and that's an outdated assumption. As we look at next-generation technologies, it's going to be demanding a robust influx of high quality data, which will help our customers enhance their predictive capabilities. It'll help them refine their processes and deliver actionable results in real time so that our customers can enable this AI enabled future. You have to have, again, this really strong, solid data foundation. If we don't have high quality data in a consistent format with strong governance and context, You cannot effectively apply AI now or in the future. Over the past few years, we've had a significant focus on building out our data platforms and developing more enterprise-level software solutions with tools to capture data robustly and scalably. So as I was saying, our System Link product, it's a data platform that efficiently ingests, processes, and analyzes lab-scale test and system data. It helps our customers to connect all the steps of the lab management process, both within and across the labs, providing the necessary context to understand the correlations between various system behaviors. 
System Link sets the foundation for applying artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques by really establishing this reliable, future-proof data infrastructure. What we're finding with our customers is that the companies that are prioritizing investments in data acquisition, processing, and analytics are going to lead the way and really be ready for the new advances in AI and how it interacts with their data. So National Instruments was acquired by Emerson. Tell me about that transition and where is it now? Yeah, so if we kind of think about that, we were acquired about 12 months ago by Emerson, and it's been really, really exciting. The integration has moved very quickly. I've been incredibly supported by the Emerson leadership team. Uh, The Emerson management system has helped to really drive a lot of operational discipline. The test and measurement business, which is formerly known as NI, was built on our strong foundation as a leader in the test and measurement space. And it's very aligned with Emerson's strategy as an automation leader. And also, we are helping Emerson to really understand how to drive a culture of innovation. That's a key hallmark of what NI brings to Emerson. Over the past 12 months, we've spent a lot of time refreshing our product and system roadmaps. And you're going to see a lot of major announcements about our software and hardware products, including NI's flagship product, LabVIEW. Fantastic. Now, what advice would you give to engineers who are just starting their careers or students who will be entering the field? Yeah, I love that one always. So I graduated from Arizona State University. I started college when I was 15 years old. There was a lot that I learned just being kind of call it different. So I was female, I'm of Indian ethnicity and extremely young. I basically came out of that experience, uh, spent 25 years at Motorola and began to grow through the executive ranks. So I ended up eventually running my own company and then got recruited at NI to run their semiconductor business. And over the past five years, I've continued to grow in my role until I was able to actually take over the acquisition of Emerson of NI, and now really learning about taking a 45-year-old company and then transforming that into a new business model inside Emerson. So as I talked to college students, and I actually did a speech last week at a university, some of what I've imparted to students is always do good work. Don't think about how you're going to get to the next role or the next thing that you want to go do in your career. Do good work in the role that you're in and make sure that as you're doing that, you continue to be visible so people know who you are and the work that you're doing. The other big advice that I give is be resilient in the face of failure. You are going to fail. There are failures in life. Just having persistence and resilience is incredibly important. Another piece that I like to tell students is maintain a learning mindset. It's always important to learn and grow continue to change and help yourself and organizations change. For a lot of the women that come through some of the technical fields, especially engineering, my advice has always been find your voice, find the way to communicate so that it lands for people, depending on what sort of an audience or group that you're in. It's incredibly important to be able to communicate in a way that will land. Continue to have confidence in your point of view and your own ability. This can be very difficult in the tech field. There's a lot of really, really intelligent people in this field. Continuing to be able to have your point of view and move something forward is very important as you're starting in your career. The other piece that I've learned in my career is really being able to have clear decision making, being able to set priorities. And then when you find that something's not working, really being able to pivot quickly. And then it's incredibly important to have good mentors, have a network, have sponsors, and then just find balance with family and friends. So those are kind of some of the different areas that I usually highlight as I talk to students. I love that. That is wonderful. All right. Well, it is time for your off the cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. What would you have? I would have street food in India. That's my absolute favorite thing to eat. Now, of course, I would not actually eat it because it would be on the street, but the types of food that they have is absolutely incredible. That sounds wonderful. Well, Ritu, it's wonderful speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to speak with you. Thanks for taking the time with us. 
Well, folks, that's all I've got for this week's Fish Fry. If you'd like more information about today's episode, check out this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com or this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal if LinkedIn is more your thing. Sure, you can follow me or us on LinkedIn, and we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon, too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me and our new animated series called Libby's Lab. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of February 21st, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.